On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sonjoy Roy, and my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, I welcome you to this session of JLF Toronto Virtual Festival. Journeys to Selfhood, Harnarayan Singh and Samra Zafar in conversation with Manjushri Thapa. A session that brings together two outstanding and heartwarming accounts of the power of resilience, tenacity, and courage. Author and broadcaster Harnarayan Singh's book, one Game at a Time, My Journey from Small Town Alberta to Hockey's Biggest Stage is a breathtaking narrative of his experiences of balancing his faith and culture on the road of becoming one of Canada's most beloved hockey presenters. The book details his years of struggle and endurance in the face of hardship and racism and breaking through societal barriers to achieve his dream. Author and entrepreneur Samra Zafar's book, A Good Wife, Escaping the Life I Never Chose, is a haunted retelling of her journey of abuse and fight against socio-cultural taboos and discrimination. The book rakes through her attempts to carve out a different path for herself and her daughters through education and the search for courage and power in the face of extreme oppression. In conversation with writer and translator Manjushri Thapa, they explore the source of their inspiration and strength. Har Narayan Singh is a co-host and play-by-play -play announcer, having called over 700 NHL games for Hockey Night in Canada, Punjabi. Having previously worked for CBC and TSN, Singh also produces a segment in Calibri called Flames TV Punjabi and serves on the board of directors for Heroes Hockey. Samra Zafar is an international speaker, best-selling author, and human rights advocate, recognized among the top 100 most powerful women in Canada. Her book, A Good Wife, Escaping the Life I Never Chose, is based on her journey of escaping an abusive child marriage and sheds light on the systemic gender-based oppression. Manjushri Thapa is the author of 10 books of fiction and literary nonfiction on her homeland, Nepal. She also translates Nepali literature into English. Her latest book is the novel All of Us in Our Own Lives, set in the cynical moneyed aid industry in Nepal. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please do send in your questions to us. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Do follow our pages at GLF Lit Fest across Twitter, Instagram and Facebook to get notified on all our upcoming sessions. You can also visit our website gliflitfest.org slash Toronto for the full schedule and information about our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present Journeys to Selfhood, Harnarayan Singh and Samra Zafar in conversation with Manjushri Thapa. Over to you, Manjushri. Thank you, Kritika. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. It said, um, I think uh, Samra is also in Toronto. I'm in Toronto. Harnarayan, you're in Alberta? Calgary. Yeah, that's Calgary. right. Calgary. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things that is said about Toronto is that everyone lives in Toronto at some point in their lives. And I know that you've also lived here at some point in your life. Um, and here is uh, JLF Toronto. So um, for that, for hosting us all, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories of many First Nations, um, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, the Anishinaabe and Ojibwe people, the Haudenosaunee, Wendat people, and uh, Toronto is still home to many First Nations and Inuit and Métis people. So thank you for letting us be here today. I'm going to start, um, you know, these are two absolutely rousing memoirs and I loved being able to read them. So thank you for writing them. Um, I'm going to start with your book, um, Harnayan. Uh, you, you, you know, you start off the memoir and your personal story of how you became such a, such a beloved um, broadcaster uh, in your family's story. So your great grandfather more than a hundred years ago came to Canada and this was, this was in the time before the Komagata Maru incident, which is a real stain on Canada's history where they returned a ship of um, uh, workers from the Punjab. And he stayed here for 10 years, went back, never wanted to see potatoes again, you know, didn't have a great experience, let's say. Um, but your father came uh, here in 1966 
and you know had to go through all of the hoops that immigrants have to go through to retrain and try and find a place for the you know you need specific Canadian skills and Canadian degrees and and things like that. So he became a teacher in Brooks, Alberta, where you were the only Sikh family in town. I don't know if that would still be the case in Brooks, but it certainly was with you growing up. So your ability to pursue your dreams and to go into broadcasting is, uh, it, it seems like a privilege that's rooted in many generations of sacrifice. Is that is that how you see it? Yeah, very, most definitely. Um, so you mentioned my great grandfather and when he came here over a hundred years ago in Canada, Canada wasn't a very welcoming place by any means. At that time, the federal government was advocating to have Canada as a country for just white people, and they were very blunt about it. And uh, so, my great grandfather, you know, he experienced a lot of uh, a lot of trials and tribulations and challenges. And as you mentioned, uh, didn't find it welcoming enough that he would wanted to have stayed. So he took risked his life, went back on a ship to go back home. And then when my parents came. Um, you know, even when my in-laws came in the 70s, that generation, uh, they really had to focus on settling the family. They had to sacrifice a lot uh, in terms of not only risking uh, and leaving their families in India and coming here for a long time without being able to go back, um, but in terms of racism, in terms of they came here with such little money. And, you know, I like to even think back, like the, the generation that I'm living, we've been able to kind of really just have everything come easy because the our parents who came here in the 60s and 70s, they had to go through all the struggles for us. So, you know, they weren't taking vacations, they weren't uh, going for a massage or anything that, you know, people like my wife and I and our generation get to do. And when I was growing up too, I was told so many times uh, that my dream to be a hockey commentator wouldn't be possible because of how I looked because of the fact that there was no diversity on television or radio and especially in the sports field. And so I think when I reflect on all of that, when I reflect on my entire family history uh, and then even myself, our journey uh, through Canada and to where I am today, it's astonishing. And I, I would, I would be, you know, it would be amazing for me to uh, be able to tell my great grandfather, you know, I think he would be absolutely flabbergasted and, shocked to see how far we've come as as a society um, and as a community that you know they didn't have the right to vote they didn't have the right to buy land there was so many issues um, you know my my father even though when he became a citizen he wasn't able to vote because of one of the voting polling stations they didn't allow a turban inside and and that happened for a few years and i also feel like they didn't have the power, they didn't have uh, enough confidence to speak up because they were worried about, you know, losing the opportunity in front of them. And, and you know, now how far we've come and you have a person like myself, born and raised in Canada, but still had to prove myself and defy the odds. And, you know, I'm able to be on mainstream and national television now. I just think that it makes someone like myself feel more grateful than the av average person because I was told this was impossible. I look at my family history and it's it's incredible what they went through. My my dad was the second person only from his village in Punjab to get a post-secondary degree. My mom went on hunger strikes just to convince her grandfather to get an education. So I just think that I, when I really reflect on it all, um, if, if it wasn't for all of their sacrifice and for them going through all of these challenges and obstacles, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I, I'm forever indebted to, to everything that they've done to, to lay out this path for someone like myself. I, you know, I love uh, in your book, you do mention that uh, even well-wishers gave you very sincere advice to go into the news instead of uh, into sport uh, broadcasting because of your background and they thought it would be an easier fit for you um, to be covering news. So it, it really is kind of an incredible story that you were able to pursue your dreams. Um, I think Samra's experience of coming to Canada is uh, linked in, in, in a way that, um, it, and it also sort of reflects my own experience of coming here from a society that is very convivial and social and, you know, very um, sort of, uh, uh, peopled to a place of isolation. So Canada is, you know, it can be a warm place, but 
Toronto can be a little cold and um, particularly Samra, the way you came, you're, you're uh, in a way, you're the first generation immigrant uh, to come here, but you came at the age of 18, already married. Um, and for the first three years, you lived in jail-like conditions with your husband who became increasingly abusive and uh, with your in-laws who were very, very controlling of everything you did, including your movements. Um, so your dream had been to study, but you came here and found yourself totally unable to pursue your um, path for many years. Can you talk about your early years uh, as a teenager, immigrant, married, young person um, in Canada? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Manjushri. And, and I just, before I get into my story, I just want to commend uh, Parnarayan for, for all his achievements. And, you know, a lot of what, what you said resonated with me. This is a land of opportunities. Uh, and it's also a land of uh, breaking barriers. Uh, so congratulations on, on everything and very inspiring. Um, and yes, when I came to Canada, it was, uh, uh, I was so lost and so scared. I was uh, I had been married, uh, engaged at 16, married at 17. And I was, you know, it, it wasn't that I wanted to do that because I, I was one of those girls who was always wanting to push the envelope. So even though there was a lot of marriage talk around me by my family, I was always the one, nah, that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to go to Harvard or Stanford, or get a degree, get an education, change the world. So uh, when, uh, when this marriage happened, it was so unexpected and so sudden uh, within the matter of a few weeks, I went from being, uh, you know, just a very outgoing, uh, independent, sort of uh, spirited uh, uh, high school teenager to being a married woman and then a mother. So, um, and I came to Kiss Canada uh, as, as a bride, as a child bride, and it was very, um, you know, uh, uh, I remember coming here and I, uh, even though it was lost and scared and feeling really uh, apprehensive, but there was also hope because I'd read enough. Uh, and at that time, internet was kind of just, so I used to have that dial up internet in my home in Pakistan. So I had read about Canada and I was like, you know, it, it was promised to me by his family and my family who'd arranged the Alliance that I would be able to go to university here. So I thought this would be the land where I would fulfill all my dreams of going to school uh, because I come from a family where no girl before me had ever, uh, gone to university, especially abroad. Um, so uh, it was a first for anyone in our generation. So I came here with a lot of that hope and starry eyed and amid even all that fear, I was like, maybe this isn't so bad. And everyone has promised me that I'll be able to go to university. And those first few years though, you know, when I wasn't allowed to go to school, I hadn't even finished high school when I got married. So I remember one day when my husband was in a good mood, he actually took me to the local high school in Mississauga. Um, and uh, uh, the principal there saw me visibly quite pregnant with this much older looking man who she put two and two together was my husband. Uh, she uh, had this look of sympathy and pity and compassion all rolled into one on her face. And she said to me pretty much that you don't, we don't think you'd fit in to the student body in the school. Uh, so we don't think it's a good idea for you to be attending. And I remember feeling so alienated and like, where do I go then? Like, uh, I don't fit in because of the fact that I'm married and becoming a mom or because of my skin color or, or what, what is it? It was fluent in English, so it wasn't a language thing, but she gave me the number for independent learning center. And uh, eventually I ended up doing all my high school courses through ILC. I would do all my chores during the day and then I would go into my room at night and I would study uh, and uh, so that it wouldn't interfere with uh, my household duties. And uh, I would often have my baby in my lap as I was doing my calculus questions and my economics graphs and that would be my escape time. Uh, but those first few years especially, were, um, there was a lot of abuse, but at that time I didn't realize it was abuse. I wasn't allowed to go out of the house, make friends, have any kind of independence, uh, even talk to my own family. It was, it was as if the, those walls, those four walls of that salmon colored house in Mississauga were my only world and were my entire world. And I often describe that feeling of living in a dark place with 
very little air, uh, enough air that you can breathe and survive, but not enough for you to be able be, to be able to be, breathe freely and thrive. It's a very, uh, it was a very much like living in constant suffocation, uh, always getting up in the morning and just wishing that it would be a dull day because that would be a good day. Uh, being on hyper alert all the time, I just wish that I don't mess up today. I mean, I don't wish I don't make him angry today. Uh, a day that would be uneventful, I would breathe a sigh of relief at night. So it, it was like walking on eggshells and living in fear all the time. Uh, and there were little glimmers of hope and kindness, like a man who paid for my uh, coffee and donut at a Tim Hortons one day, or, uh, you know, um, just uh, when I used to take my daughter to the earlier center and uh, a woman who said a few kind words. So there were hopes and little rays of sunshine that shone through that darkness, but it was a very dark world and, uh, and a very um, lost world. In fact, at that time, I wanted to be anywhere but Canada. I, uh, you know, so I, loved your book. It's very inspiring and moving and also harrowing because of everything you went through. But it, you know, it's an incredible story of how you moved out of that extreme isolation and abuse and found the strength. And as you say, you, you, there were little sources of um, a sort of hope for you. So, you know, a, a few people that you met. So uh, once, I, I think you write about going to Ontario, you know, Ontario early years um, and having someone there give you the number for Assaulted Women's Helpline. Um, and then at times you, you grew up in the UAE, also your family was based in the UAE. So when you would go and visit your family again, you would feel like yourself again. So you sort of regain your sense of self, which you had totally lost. Um, so, you know, you moved out of there and made these incredible strides in, you know, maybe about 10 years, the person you became to the person you had been when you first came to Canada became a very different person. Um, can you talk about the sources of strength that you got to make that big move, um, to slowly move away from abuse? Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, the biggest sources I look back were those random moments of kindness. You know, the, the lady at the Ontario Earlier Center who offered uh, me her phone and said go into my office and make some calls I'm going to watch your daughter while you're there because she noticed the signs of abuse before I even knew what to call it uh, she noticed how jittery I would get when um, if the class ran over or how anxious I would get you know if I if you know um, my daughter was taking too much time or anything like that so um, and I wouldn't talk to anyone and I wouldn't engage with in, in any conversations because I was just so afraid that my husband's always watching me and he'd be mad at me that I'm talking to because isolation is the biggest tool that abusers use. So I was extremely isolated and told that Canada is a big, bad world and a bad country and I shouldn't be talking to anybody. Uh, and I was told for a very long time that I would be deported if I left my husband. Uh, so his parents and him, they would tell me you'd be deported and sent back to Pakistan and you would lose the child because you don't have an education and you don't have a, a, a job and you uh, and I sponsored you. So, and I had no way of knowing better at all because I was not allowed to talk to anybody else. So um, it was very much like a, living in a, in a fancy prison, really. Um, but there were, there were things that, you know, the main thing that I would say gave me that, um, that sort of spark was education. Even during those dark times, there was this voice in my head that maybe I can go to school, maybe I can do something. And that was the one thing I wasn't willing to give up on. Like I, they, every other thing I was trying, I was trying to bend myself out of shape to fit in and to be who they wanted me to be. But I wasn't willing to give up, give up on my education. So I finished my high school courses through distance learning. Then I applied to university and I couldn't go because he and his family, they wouldn't pay my university fees, even though, and I couldn't get OSAP, uh, which is the student funding, because uh, they look at household income and his income was above the threshold. I never had a penny on me. Uh, I wrote letters to them, but they said, no, it's your family decision. And I was like, well, it's not really a family decision. It's their decision. I'm not involved in that decision. But it, the request fell on deaf ears. And so I couldn't go to university when I first applied. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I need to make money. So I started to uh, offer babysitting services in my own home. 
and because uh, I wasn't allowed to go out and get a job. And I, most of my money would be taken away from me, but I would stash a little bit every month on the side. It took me another two, three years to save up my little nest egg for my first year tuition fee as a part-time student. So it was after 10 years of marriage and two kids when I finally, at the age of 26, uh, started university at uh, UT Mississauga. And, uh, and, you know, in those days, I also make little other strides. Like I figured out that the only way to get anything is to get my mother-in-law on board. So I got her on board with the daycare that I uh, thought, okay, I said, you know what, I mean, we should, we should maybe take driver's license, uh, driving lessons together. We can both get our license together. And then I got my license. She didn't pass her test, so I stopped paying for lessons as well. So I figured out little manipulative ways to get things done. That's how I got my cell phone, my first car. Uh, and, um, and then when I started university, I think that was a big turning point for me because it was the first time I was being treated with kindness and respect for the very things that I had been ridiculed all my life for. Uh, my intelligence, my individuality, my goals, my ambitions. And that's when I started to get my confidence uh, in this country. I started to go to counseling at, on campus. I would skip class to go to counseling because I didn't want my husband to find out that I was staying on, uh, on campus more than I was supposed to. So I learned about my rights as a Canadian, as a woman, as a human being. And eventually the biggest factor was learning that my daughters are growing up thinking that this was normal. And I didn't want them to normalize abuse and experience it in their own lives. I had to break the cycle for them. I had seen my father being abusive and I had seen, and then my husband was abusive. I did not want my daughters to normalize that behavior. So um, uh, one day as I was standing in front of a mirror with a bruise on my face, I talked to myself and like, this is it. I'm not going to cover it up anymore. I have to leave, uh, if not for myself, but for the sake of my daughter. So uh, that is really what, you know, there was a lot of like, there wasn't really one big aha moment, but there were a lot of little things that contributed to, uh, like I always say, leaving is a process. I tried to leave five times before that, and I was either sent back by my family or I went back because of some barrier that I faced. But each of those steps brought me closer to the ultimate step of leaving uh, because I, I was always able to think, okay, proactively, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? And eventually it worked. And, and I think the biggest thing at that point was having a support system of some sort. Um, and uh, you, you, the University of Toronto gave that to me. And um, here we are today. It's an incredible story. It really is um, very inspiring. Um, I, I wanted to ask Harna, and now, you know, I prepared for this talk by actually listening to Hockey Night in Punjabi. Um, I don't understand Punjabi, but I just, it's its its infectious, right? Just You just get pulled into the energy of your broadcasting and um, your sort of passion for hockey. Now, your sense of self is very rooted. I mean, we talked about family to begin with, but also in the Sikh faith and in your community and in your language. Um, and... A lot of people, you're famous for your broadcasts in hockey and in sport, but fewer people know about your other passion, which is uh, kirtan and singing kirtans at, you know, occasions, like formal occasions, right, you, is where you would perform them. Does, what is the relationship, like, is your, does your voice come out of, you know, the language, the Punjabi language, the, the, um, Kirtan, you know, and the cultural sort of uh, memory of all of this. How how is that related to your individual voice? Well, I think it's a it's a really good question. I mean, for me, it's an anchor in my life. Um, it's an emotional outlet. Uh, I feel that it's an avenue for prayer. We're very lucky in the Sikh faith that music is such a big uh, proponent, big part of it. Whenever you go to a Gurdwara a Sikh temple. Uh, there will be music and, and it's a part of every, you know, if you're practicing sick, it's a part of your birthdays, it's a part of your anniversaries, it's a part of um, all, all sorts of family and life events that you have. And so I feel lucky that way. And I feel also that, you know, had it not been for Keith, then I probably wouldn't have been able to be as close to my faith as I am today. Um, first and foremost, I think um, for me, it was fun. The, the tabla was my first love. I talk about that in the book and, and being able to learn. My parents know a little bit of uh, tabla and harmonium. And so learning just the basics from them, but then becoming really um, obsessed with it. Just the same way, very a lot of parallels to my obsession with hockey and, and the same way with tabla and kirtan. And 
Um, I, I would say that, you know, uh, for me, it, it also allowed me to learn more about what the scriptures are saying. And so we call it Gurbani. And so the, the hymns that we're singing, the translations of those hymns have really shaped me into the person I am today. And I, I loved how, um, you know, Guru Nanak uh, was able to have a, a Muslim Ravab player with him and a, a Hindu as well. And they all performed together. And I just found that beautiful, um, especially part of how we learn in Canada about multiculturalism and what that represented. And, and so um, I would say that just in the same way I was uh, I'm trying to emulate broadcasters and hockey players, the same way I would emulate uh, Sikh musicians. And so uh, we were very fortunate to have a number of Sikh musicians uh, stay at our house. And my, my mom kind of nurtured that passion by get, buying me some different instruments as, as a kid when I was growing up. And and to be, you mentioned that um, I'm known as the hockey person now. Uh, it was it used to be the opposite before Hockey Night in Canada, before I began on that path, I was more known as this this uh, kind of kid at Gordora or youngster who was always there and always performing. And I, I was able to go on tour with many other uh, famous Sikh musicians. And um, and then, you know, we've been able to perform all around North America, but also at the Golden Temple in Amritsar, which is a, a re very rare, special thing for someone who's born outside of India. Uh, so for me, it's it really has been, as I mentioned, the anchor in the sense of it it's provides that support in terms of a, that emotional outlet, but it's so much fun as well. Um, we call it Rudari in in uh, in Punjabi, where th this music is not scripted, and so you are able to um, w with your own kind of um, passion, and, and you can switch it into any different way. And I love how there's so many genres and there's so many different styles within it and so i think that aspect has really helped me be the person who i am today and those two passions of hockey and kirtan have kind of run parallel the book is the very first time i had married them both together um prior to the book i kept the kirtan and and that side uh separate and the hockey side separate i didn't maybe know because my, my journey has also been about becoming comfortable in my own skin, uh, I didn't maybe know how the hockey world uh, would react, but the book is the first time it's all come together. And I've, I'm very, you know, I feel blessed to say that um, it's had a really positive reaction. I think a lot of people in the hockey world who I know who are of people of the majority, they're very happily surprised um, that there was this whole other side of me that they didn't know about. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to be really lucky because at the end of um, the audience questions, which will come up s shortly, um, we've asked you to uh, sing a kirtan, which I'm really looking forward to. But before that, I also want to ask you, now you mentioned in the book that you basically had to invent a new hybrid language when you were broadcasting hockey in Punjabi. And the book ends with this absolutely beautiful um, sort of glossary of terms, <laughs> of uh, uh, hockey terms that you had to trans. Basically, you're, you're a translator, right? You've translated it. A, a whole sort of sport into another language. Uh, could you read out some of the terms? Um, uh, like, you know, bad period is, uh, I, I'm not going to mangle the Punjabi word. <laughs> no worries. Word, but the team needs some chai tea to wake <laughs> up, you know, things like that. Could you just go through a few, do a little bit of a reading, please? Yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, and translator in one sense, but then we have to, as you mentioned, we had to be really creative and our show, Hockey Night Punjabi, I'd say it it incorporates um, the personality of the community. We are loud. We love to laugh. We love our music. We love our food. All of those things kind of just naturally came up, be, became a part of the broadcast. And I think it really struck a chord with the community and they became to love the, you know, that's one of the reasons why they love the show. And so you mentioned, uh, so if a team has a bad period, uh, you know, in, in common uh, conversation, uh, in Punjabi, would say So then we we'd say like the team needs a the team needs a cup of chai tea here in the intermission before they come back so that they can actually properly play because that was such a bad period, right? And so we have a we have quite a bit of fun with this. So um, hockey, ice hockey, can be a very physical game. Um, it can be uh, there's a lot of uh, even contact allowed. 
um, as a part of the rules. And sometimes between the whistles, the players can start um, mouthing off to one another. You know, there's the rivalry there and it's quite uh, vi visible. And so hockey sticks used to be made of wood. And sometimes in a game, you know, a player out of anger might try to cross check another player with, with this stick. And uh, because hockey sticks used to be made out of wood, sometimes if a player, it used to happen more, there's less violence now for sure. It's, it's decreased a lot. Um, but um, if, if you cross check someone in the face and the sticks used to be made of wood, so we called it like that he's that person's feeding the person some wood curry like because it the sticks hitting them in the face and you know so we had a lot of fun um, <clears throat> excuse me so the first scrum of the game the first time in the game where the players are at each other's throats and they're kind of like uh, angry with each other and the enthusiasm is there and there's five players on each on each team at the ice at any given point. And when they're all together and kind of holding each other and they're angry, um, we kind of made a funny thing in a, in an Indian wedding. There's a, a ceremony called the Milni where the where the the families are formally introduced to each other. So you know the mother and the fa the fathers will meet each other, the mothers will meet each other, and so we say we oh Milni hogi kadari and that this is. This is just the beginning here. They're just getting introduced to one uh, to one another, and it's going to get create more crazy as it goes on. And there's just there's we've had a lot of fun. I'll give you one more, um, and that's so in English they call it the penalty box when a player is penalized for hooking or some sort of violation. They have to sit in the penalty box for uh, at least two minutes, and so instead of penalty box, I converted it into saja da dabba, which translates back into English as box of punishment and these types of uh, little creative creations people have loved and uh, it makes our show like we're not as much business like we, we talk about all the storylines and all the important information but we add a lot of masala and we add a lot of um, you know uh, a flavor in terms of making it a more entertaining product and uh, the recipe has uh, has been well received yes it has been um, we're we're um sadly uh running out of time believe it or not but um, we're going to go to audience questions soon but before that i would really uh love if samra if you could read a section from your memoir um because your voice in the book it's it's a co-authored book um you wrote it with uh let me see with Meg. yeah it's it's uh, yeah she she she's the one who took my words and and structured them into uh so she really got my voice down, which I'm really grateful for. Perfect. I'd love to hear hear a section of it. Yeah, absolutely. So on the, this section that I'm going to read is, is actually uh, in the same vein as what we were talking of little moments of hope and kindness. And uh, like I said, the only place I was allowed to go was that uh, Ontario Early Earth Centre. And one day coming back from there, uh, my daughter started asking me uh, for a donut and I uh, uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a very powerful scene, so I'm just going to um, briefly read that. It was another short delay in my return home from the drop-in centre, a quick stop at Tim Hortons to get a donut with sprinkles for Aisha. I stood at the counter after ordering and dug into my coat pocket to retrieve the toonie that I thought was there. But I couldn't find it. I stepped back from the counter, searching all of my other pockets and then turning my attention to the diaper bag. My embarrassment was ratcheting into panic. Even as I anxiously worked my way through the bag, I knew my search was fruitless. I never had any money on me. I had a bank account, which I'd been required to open when we got the mortgage, but it sat empty. The only deposit had been $1,000 that my father wired to me for my birthday, and I'd managed to buy it myself only a few toiletries with that money before my husband transferred everything to his own account. He gave me no spending money of my own. If we were out shopping and I needed to buy something for my daughter, or for the house, he might hand me a few dollars. He would say, why do you need money? It's not like you go anywhere without me. He had been right, of course, but every once in a while, I had tried to squirrel away a few coins like the one I thought was resting in my pocket. I had moved the stroller away from the counter and was getting ready to slink out of the store in embarrassment when I heard a voice. Excuse me, can I buy you a coffee? I looked up. A white man in his early 30s was standing before me. He was pointing to the counter. No, thank you, I said, mortified. I, I, I don't want coffee. 
All the things that my husband had told me about men were beating through my mind. Why was the man doing this? Was this some way to get me alone? To attack me? What did you order then? The man asked. I glanced quickly at his face. His eyes were soft and kind, and his tone was sympathetic, not coercive, not seductive. He felt sorry for me. A donut, I said weakly, glancing down at the stroller. The man smiled at my daughter. Let me get that for her. I protested, but he put the money down on the counter and handed me the bag with the donut. Have a nice afternoon, he said, as he headed out the door. I watched him get in his car and exit the parking lot. Then I pushed the stroller outside. Sitting on a dusty bench, feeding small pieces of donut to Aisha, tears overtook me. I wanted to be grateful for the man's generosity, but all I felt was stinging humiliation. What kind of life was I living that I didn't even have two dollars on me? And what kind of person was I that people took such pity on me? The answer was obvious. I was poor. I was powerless. I was pathetic. Oh, geez. Such a moving uh, memoir. Um, we're, we're getting in questions, so I'm going to... Um, I have lots of questions of my own, but I will defer to the audience questions. Um, so starting with a question for Harnayan, uh, Regina asks, what made you undertake this project of writing down your life journey and how did you begin this book? Yeah, my story was kind of out there uh, in s small snippets uh, with different media interviews over the years. And so the publishing company actually approached me and um, asked me to write my life story down in detail. And here I am in my mid thirties and uh, I was quite surprised. But then secondly, I also, you know, this, this, I realized now recently with a lot of things that have been going on in the world that this seed of doubt has been something that's been planted inside me um, since I was a kid. And, and it's, you know, different people who I've met over the years, whether they're professionals or in the industry or, even our family doctor who told me that this wouldn't be possible or you need to be realistic or, you know, you should focus on something else and all that kind of stuff. It planted this seed of doubt that's given me a lot of a lack of confidence, even though, you know, I love hockey, I love being a broadcaster, but there's been times where, you know, I'm holding the mic and I've, I've been, I haven't been confident about it. In the same way, I reacted in the same way with the book. I, I said to the publishers, if you can imagine this, I, I literally put on the brakes saying, are you sure? Like, who's going to buy a book about me? Like, does this, does this make sense? And my, my wife's a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and we even counter offered that. Why don't we do a children's book and sell uh, instead? I didn't just even, I didn't really even picture, um, you know, this coming to fruition. But when we talked, we were on a similar wavelength of, they wanted to tell a positive story of diversity that it can work. And, and that's been my message when I go to talk to students across Canada, if I'm ever invited uh, at high schools and universities, that if a person like me can have their dream come true and be on TV, we're very lucky to have this um, opportunity in front of us, as Samra was saying too, that it is a land of opportunity. And so that message is what we wanted to portray, a positive message of diversity, and it's about defying the odds. And when we kind of met on that wavelength, then I realized, okay, this is this. They they understand my story. They understand the message, and we we kind of started into the process. And now, what's been I'm really grateful that there's been so many other racialized uh, people, people of color, visible minorities who've reached out, and I realized that this isn't just my story. There's there's so many people out there who have uh, can find parallels, and it resonates with them. And then one more thing to add on that the flip side perspective has been fascinating to me i've had people reach out who are white who are astonished um that you know i had to go through so many uh, instead of the average hockey broadcaster i probably had to go through so many more hoops and obstacles to get here i've also had people who um i haven't ever kept in touch with who i grew up in my small town of brooks alberta and they've reached out and said hey i don't know if you remember me but I read your book and they and one one girl I remember specifically saying that she she was so shocked that she said we were in the same classrooms in the same hallways and she goes I can't even imagine that you were going through an entirely different experience and we had no idea 
And so to be able to provide that perspective and then in hopes of not only inspiring others, but maybe giving people of the majority a perspective that look at what others have to go through and so that they can, when they meet someone who's different, they can you know, treat that person in a more unique and respectful and loving way. And so it, the impact has been tremendous. So I'm really grateful to have gone through the process, but I was skeptical at first. <laughs> well, I'm really glad you did uh, go through with it. Um, Samra, we've got a question. We've got a couple of questions, one from Jenna Ali and another from Keith Peter. I'm going to sort of put them in together um, since we're running a little bit short on time. So the first question is, have you developed any specific steps or methods to make the topic of abuse a more open conversation in your role in trying to bring forward a more safe and inclusive space? That's from Jen Ali. And then Keith Peter asks, could you please tell us a little bit about Brave Beginnings? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you so much uh, for asking those questions, uh, Jenna and Keith. So um, yes, absolutely. There's 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 a lot of different facets to abuse. You know, when you think about abuse, when you think about violence against women, people hear that word. They they imagine uh, bruised and battered faces. When you think about, for example, child marriages, they imagine you know a child being taken kicking and screaming into some corner and being forced to uh, sign on some pieces of paper. But it, in reality, actually, it doesn't play out that way. The physical abuse is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much underneath it. There's a lot of non-physical abuse. In my marriage, yes, I did face physical abuse, but the abuse and the trauma that still haunts me time to time is the emotional and, and non-physical and, and financial and the oppression, because that's constant, right? And it, it, is, it escalates, it's insidious. It starts with those uh, demeaning comments and making you feel worthless and making you feel like, you you know, there's no other option and isolation and all of that and eventually escalates uh, more and more and I often describe it as uh, if you put a frog in cold water and turn the heat up ever so slightly the frog's body temperature keeps adjusting to the rising temperature of the water and the frog will eventually cook to death without even realizing it's it, the insidious progression is like that so um, in my case as well it was like that and that's kind of what I do in my advocacy work is highlight all the different facets of abuse and how they're interconnected. Similarly, you know, uh, women um, from all walks of life are susceptible to fa to violence. Unfortunately, violence against women, gender-based violence is a universal issue, but there are so many cultural intersectionalities to it. Women who are from immigrant backgrounds, women of color who are refugees, who have language barriers or other uh, cultural and uh, racialized stigma and shame have it have a much, much harder time leaving abuse. So even though a white woman and uh, and someone like me may face abuse, but the the barriers to me for uh, that I face to leaving and speaking up are a lot higher uh, because of the elevated shame and stigma uh, associated with it in in the community and culture that I come from. So it's very important to look at these things and these issues through a lens of intersectionality and not paint the entire issue with the with a one size fits all approach. Um, similarly, girls who are sub subjected to child marriage already the marriage starts from a place of control. So domestic abuse is just a, a you know it it, it, it almost always happens and it's all about control so that's kind of what I try to do more is tackle the root causes of abuse and uh, and you know work from the ground up uh, because it's important that we are aware and we teach our children about uh, about early signs of abusive behavior we teach ourselves about our knowledge and about our rights in this country we teach our, our youth about healthy and respectful behaviors because that's how we're going to start moving the dial by being proactive rather than just reactive, right? It had both, both those things have to go hand in hand. And then coming to Keith's question, um, uh, that uh, uh, Brave Beginnings. The so Brave Beginnings is uh, um, a registered nonprofit that I founded, and it is a mentorship program based on helping survivors of abuse build better lives after escaping. So we partner with shelters to identify women who've left and who are now, so on average, uh, women will go back seven times to their abusers before they finally leave because of all the barriers and leaving is one part but staying away is harder because you're alone you're lost you sometimes don't have support system your family may have shunned you your culture may have abandoned you and then you also face all these other things of lack of confidence and the uh, if trauma effects and anxiety and just feeling like you're absolutely lost you're lacking life skills sometimes i didn't even know how to pay my bills when i left my marriage so it was very scary right so at that time it's a very vulnerable time 
So we uh, match these survivors who've taken that brave step of leaving. We match them with mentors and mentors are women in the community who are uh, passionate, empathetic, not necessarily survivors themselves, but they want to really give back some of their time, maybe two to four hours a month to really hold somebody's hand metaphorically and help them in that journey of building a new life. Um, and that's why it's called Brave Beginnings. And um, and we are, uh, we are in the process of getting our charitable status. And if you want to learn more, you can check out our website, bravebeginnings.ca. Uh, and uh, it's it's something that I'm extremely proud of. And and the and our board and everybody involved is so diverse. We've got a great male-female representation. And that's something that I really wanted to stress is that the importance of male allyship, because this isn't a gender issue. This isn't a, a, a women's rights issue. This is a human rights issue. And it's not a men versus women issue. It's all of us versus together versus the issue of uh, gender-based violence. And and um, the more we come together, uh, the more the more united we are. And, uh, and, and the more we're gonna be able to ta tackle this problem with a lot of different um, prongs of solution. That's Beautiful, really inspiring work. Um, we are coming to the end of our session, so I'm going to ask Harnaren if you will please um, end the session with uh, Kirtan, because that is just going to be such a treat. Sure, that would be my pleasure. And I'll just take one minute to set up. Yeah. So if you wanted to just talk with Samra for one more minute, and I'll be back sure, with yeah. you. Just um, uh, okay, Samra, a one minute answer to a question, um, which is, Samra, did you find any support and inspiration in your own community during your struggle? Sadly, uh, not much at all. Uh, I, in fact, my own family didn't support me. I had committed some kind of a grave sin uh, by leaving uh, and speaking up against abuse. And um, my mother didn't want to, and to tell uh, a lot of her extended, I mean, eventually she did come around, uh, but uh, but there have been a lot of my family members who've abandoned me or, or, or I have distanced myself from them because I'd rather be true to who I am rather than fit into, into that box. And, um, and I faced a lot of stigma. In fact, that was the biggest, um, I, I guess, biggest crippling factor that I faced after leaving was not the fact that I was working five jobs and trying to make ends meet. I'm, of course, the practical stuff was hard and, and, and I was working really hard, but but the cultural shame and stigma was was much worse. And, and I was called a shameless woman, an unfaithful wife, a bad mother, all kinds of things uh, because I committed something that is so um, bad and uh and and have i've had to distance myself sadly but uh i have a lot of people in my life today that sort of embrace me and love me for who i am and i'm and i'm extremely grateful and that's the that's the beauty of this country yeah well i have to say uh you know one of the more moving uh things about the book was just the support that you got from your daughters um yeah. and just how much you know how 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 clear it was for them that you needed to break away and oh absolutely my daughters are my biggest cheerleaders and uh, we are more like best friends than mother and daughters we're we're like uh, partners in life and my younger daughter has nicknamed us the power girls that's our family's name uh and uh and you know mm -hmm. when i look at them and the strong uh, amazing young women they are that's when I feel like you know that's my biggest success like nothing else everything else kind of fades away but they, just seeing who they are fills me with so much pride and so much happiness and joy yeah wonderful um let me see do we have Harnaren back on them um, do we have Harnaren back on them um, yes Okay, so are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. You are? Okay. Sorry about taking longer than one minute. Okay, so I'll keep it very brief because I know we're over time. I didn't know this. <laughs> so I'm just going to sing a very short him and because of everything going on with the coronavirus um, so just a prayer for the for humanity jagata jalanda rakhla apni kirpa tar jagata jalanda rakhla apni kirpa tar jagat jalanda rakh 
Thank you both for this lovely conversation, um, for the readings. I'm going to hand it back to Kritika. Um, and thank you, thank talk. you, Manjushri. That's a perfect note to end the session. Thank you so much, Harnarayan. That was lovely. Thank you, Samra. Thank you, Harnarayan, for sharing your stories with us through your books and this session. It's inspired us, and I'm sure it, it's inspired a lot of people across the world. Thank you all for watching and being a lovely audience. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers available through the bookstores listed on our website. Once again, we'd like to thank all our partners for their support towards the festival. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will join us back for our next session, The Uninhabitable Earth, David Wallace-Wells and James Raffin in conversation with Marcus Mensch which is at 2 p.m. EST, 11 a.m. PST, and 12.30 a.m. IST. We now present Vikram Chandra in conversation with Aruni Kashyap on Granthika from the Jaipur Writer Short Series. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Aruni Kashyap and I am logging in from Athens, Georgia. And with me, we have today uh, uh, Professor Vikram Chandra, novelist, uh, and he's a professor of creative writing at University of California, Berkeley. And he's also the author of Sacred Games, which is now a phenomenal Netflix production that I'm very, very addicted to. And also many other novels such as Red Earth and Pouring Rain. And he is going to talk to us about Granthika today. And Granthika is this wonderful, new novel writing app and uh, Professor Bikram Chandra is also uh, very very conversant with the coding system of computers and he has developed this app on his own to sort of support writers who have um, complex storylines and complex characters and many many small things that they want to get right and uh, and Bikram is, is, is that kind of a novelist who whose novels have, especially Sacred Games, have huge cast of characters, many small uh, things that you have to keep in mind, um, and as well as uh, many subplots that you have to keep in mind. So I think this app is going to be a great help for anybody who wants to uh, write a simple novel or even a complex novel. I have been talking to Vikram about it, and, and Vikram will share a lot more information about Grantika. Vikram, just for people who don't know anything about Grantika, um, and they are looking into the market for a novel writing software. What would you What would you tell them? Uh, hi, Aruni. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so, my uh, uh, urge to create a new kind of writing software software for writing came from my own need. So, I write, as you said, I write books, I write novels, and what has always frustrated me with, with me with the software we currently have available 
is that say you're writing in Word, you have your manuscript in one place, you have your notes in another place, maybe you know you have index cards on the wall to represent your timeline and what happens to me is that i would be writing something i would need to look up a note from 4 years ago and it would take me half an hour to find that information right so you end up doing this manual labor bookkeeping in order to write a book so the effort was to create software uh, which had everything in one place right that all your data your manuscript and all your information your knowledge would be in one place. So I was thinking rather than trying to talk in the abstract about it, I would actually share my screen and show you. And I then, think that's uh, a great idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Please. Are you seeing it now? Chapter yes, one, please. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. So this Absolutely. is Hound of the Baskervilles in um, in Granthika. So as you can see uh, right here in the on the right hand side, the large panel is where you would write your manuscript, right? Um, in, like in any other word processor. On the left here, you have a table of contents, which is built for writing. So you can use chapters and parts and sections and scenes in as much detail as you want, right? There's nothing enforced upon you. So here, um, I've just used chapters and scenes to, to divide up uh, the manuscript of Hound of the Baskervilles. And then on the top here, uh, we have uh, the what you might call the, uh, the elements of fiction. So you have characters, you have locations, you have objects, and you have events, right? Uh, this is what we all use um, in, in any fiction to create a sense of narrative, to create a universe. So um, what's interesting though about Granthika is that I, I hope you can see this, there's certain words which are highlighted, right? Which are showing up in these different colors. Now, these are what we call mentions. Uh, mentions in the same sense uh, as you would use on Facebook or Twitter, right? Where you're talking about something and you mention it, right? And the nice thing here is that if I put my cursor in Sherlock Holmes and I press uh, and I press one key, it jumps right to the page for Sherlock Holmes, right? Where what I've got is I've got a description, I've got a, a some notes, and in the notes that I've got a reference to a web page, right? And then if if I hit one other key. I pop right back to my manuscript, mm -hmm. right? So the, the idea is that as you go along, as you write, you create um, uh, you, you create your database of knowledge as you write, right? So it's yeah. always there, it's one click away. And then um, uh, what the other stuff I have, you notice the image here of Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. I like to take photographs of things when I'm writing. And so you can put in as many images as you like. Uh, I'll show you events in a little bit, but these are all the events that in the story that Sherlock Holmes participates in, right? Actually, these are not all. I've just started putting the event information in. Um, and then the other uh, interesting thing that you get for free from using these mentions is that then you can actually see every time that Sherlock Holmes is mentioned in the entire manuscript, you can actually see it right here. And if I click on one of these guys, I'm taken instantly to that place in the manuscript, right? Yeah. Uh, we also then, uh, you might be wondering, how do you create these mentions? So you can do it in the usual uh, Twitter manner or Facebook manner, you use the at sign, you start typing, you hit Sherlock, uh, you choose Sherlock Holmes, and then that is made, uh, the name is filled in for you and that's automatically done. Uh, what I uh, prefer to do is I write something and I use, what we call an analyzer. And that goes through your what you've just written and actually finds what it thinks are uh, people, places, events, and suggests them to you, right? It's saying, I, I think this is a reference to Sherlock Holmes. And if you're satisfied, you hit apply. Uh, and now all of those mentions are made for you, right? So the, 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 we're using natural language recognition to achieve that. Uh, okay. One of the other uh, interesting, um, uh, what I find very useful is the ability to uh, keep track of events, right? And this for me becomes a big problem because I like, I have storylines, I have real events, I have fictional events. And so what I've been doing until now is using hand-drawn timelines, uh, index cards, I found time um, timeline software, but again, that's not connected to your manuscript in any way. Right, so here you can say that a certain event took place on 26 September, 1888. 
uh, it's one hour before another event. So you can create these kind of chains of events. And then once you start putting in these events, you actually have a timeline, right? Um, which shows you exactly what the chronological relationship of your events are. If I double click on one of these things, um, I see the information about that. I can click on this button here and be instantly taken to that event. So you can think of it as a kind of web or framework of knowledge, and you can then navigate this web in any way that you see fit, that any way that is useful to you, right? Um, and then uh, I think we're running out of time. So I just want to show you one feature that we are adding right now is what we call the board view, right? So you can see as, if, as with index cards, you can see the entire structure of your manuscript, each chapter, what uh, you can add the uh, descriptions there. Um, but what I like actually is this view, which is actually the same, same information, but presented in a left to right fashion, right? And so I can see that in chapter one of Founder of the Baskervilles, there are two scenes, right? And then I can scroll back and forth uh, and see my entire manuscript in, in that way, right? Uh, so uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So I hope that made sense, right? The, the concept translated into, into actual working software. Yes, it is. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, I actually teach uh, uh, novel writing courses at the university. And uh, one of the things that we struggle with, uh, I struggle with, and a lot of my uh, doctoral students, they struggle with, is should we outline, should we not outline? How detailed we should be outlining? Um, is outlining useful? So as somebody who has written such narratives, very complex, big, big, uh, in narratives in large canvases and you're using an app. Uh, I wanted to know one thing, do you outline and and how does this app help people in outlining their novels? I outline in a in a haphazard general sense in the first, uh, in the first few drafts. Uh, so what I have is a general sketch of my plan going forward in my head, a very rough one. And so I, I what I would do in earlier uh, when I was using other software is that I would uh, write a kind of descriptive note and then keep writing above that, right? When I got a sense of what was going to come next, right? So here, what I'm doing in the actual fiction that I'm working on is that I have the exact same system, except that I'm able to use these kind of nice units of sections or scenes, right, to break that up. And then I can very easily grab one scene and move it above another one, right? Or, or drag it down and put it 10 scenes later, right? So it makes rearranging much easier. Of course, um, I think this is something that, I think this is something that a lot of modern writers would love because I think there is a more and more um, um, consensus uh, for uh, people who outline. Uh, I actually watch a lot of writing communities, videos and conversations, mm -hmm. and a lot of writers who are actually, um, writing these days, they like to write. Um, I don't know uh, um, about everyone, all my friends, but definitely I see more and more conversations about outline. Also, I think that I'm creative writing classes uh, across the United States uh, are also pushing and encouraging people to outline their books a little bit. So I think yeah. uh, this, all of this sounds really, really fascinating. So I'm, I'm thank you so much for, for uh, sharing and creating this, sharing with us uh, about this app and also creating this app. My last question is about how do you see this app as different, if you want, if you would like to sort of say in a few words from other apps like Google Docs. I mean, it's very, which is very basic, but also, the, also there is a final draft and Scrivener. Mm. I, I have used some of these apps and I have gone back to good old Microsoft Word mm -hmm. because That's I thought good. that... And also some of these apps have very long tutorial sessions on YouTube. So I thought, and I found myself watching hours and hours of, hours of those tutorial sessions instead of writing. And so it was like, I had to train myself to master an app instead of yeah, writing yeah. my novel and gaining mastery over the story arc and the characters. So yeah, I was yeah. wondering how is Granthika uh, different uh, than that? So uh, in terms of difference of functionality, um, our effort, and I think what makes us unique, is that everything that you need to write a book can be contained in one place. And then growing from that, um, the ability, like I just showed, to go quickly from your manuscript to your information and back, right? So there's no interruption of your flow, right? Where you're opening another program to look up, or you, you know, you're opening a notebook 
uh, to do all of that. Um, and uh, also, I mean, I didn't have time to show um, some other features, but we are adding rapidly. We've got these metrics, which go far beyond word count and sentence count. It shows you your vocabulary richness, uh, overused words, um, things like that. Um, and then uh, we've been very cognizant that we don't want of the fact that we don't want writers to struggle uh, and have a steep learning curve, right? So the effort has been to have a simple, easy to use um, writing app that has depth, right? The further that you explore it, the more that it shows you. And um, I should say that our youngest user right now, as far as we know, is seven years old, right? And she's happily writing her stories within it. Uh, creating characters and locations and so forth. Um, so try it out. Um, I, we have a free subscription for uh, all educators and students at all levels. So especially we're really interested in using this for pedagogy um, in, in making teaching and learning easier. That sounds really fascinating. I ha I have a plan for a very long novel. Maybe I will I will um, make use of this app and see where, where it takes me. And um, most importantly, I think this app is designed by a novelist, uh, and 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 I think the other apps are not probably coming from similar minds. I think the USP of this app is that it is uh, from the minds of a writer, and it has emerged more out of practice and a need for it instead of um, mm. instead of just a great idea by a software engineer who thought that let me let me design a novel writing app. I think I think. I think you know what writers need because you you are a writer and you are a teacher of write, creative writing. So I think that is going to uh, be the big sort of draw for this for this app. So thank you so much. I'm actually excited to use it now, uh, okay. and uh, and I also recommend uh, my students and friends who are writers. Thank you so much, Arani. Did we cover everything, or do you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Let, <laughs> let me stop the recording. Festival is the world's largest free festival of its kind.
daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night. It's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees the confluence of publishers, writers and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavour of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, shared history in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalao Tsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the multi-city Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts – Celebrating the Arts For more information visit www.teamworkarts.com Hello everyone and welcome to Kahani Online where you discover the magic of storytelling in all its forms. Very special guest with a very special story. Please welcome actor and author Soha Ali Khan. The story that I've chosen is called Someday. Here it is and it's by Alison McGee and Peter H. Reynolds. It's a story that I've read many times to Inaya. Everyone, grab a pencil, eraser and a notebook as we are about to learn how to write short stories. That's very simple. 
All you have to remember is five points. Grumpy, we have a special story for you that dates back to the year 1962. Major Shaitan Singh Bhatti and his soldiers. चीन ने भारत पर हमला बोला था. ये लड़ाई पूरा एक महीना चली थी. Our storyteller today is Katrina Zail, all the way from Lithuania in in um in Europe. Yes, in Europe. And she's going to tell us about some strange and fascinating mythological creatures. Today I will introduce you all to Lithuanian mythology. I will show you our modern world full of hidden myth, mythical creatures. I will narrate to you an episode of from one of our oldest epics, the Ramayana. We'll be waiting to hear from you. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.